edition of Shed Talk, my uh, weekly magazine video series looking at the uh, keeping, breeding and showing of uh, cage birds and with a special focus on the exhibition style budgery car. Well, as I say, the best made plans in all that. Um, I was due to, I'm sure you, those of you that watch the show know that I was due to go up to Stafford um, last weekend, uh, pick up all the equipment, get some video of the um, various birds on show and the sales and all that sort of stuff. Um, and lo and behold, on the Thursday, uh, started to feel a little bit rough. Um, did a test and I had caught the dreaded COVID. So uh, that put paid to my trip to Stafford. Fortunately, you know, fully vaccinated and all that. Um, it hasn't hit me too badly. You might just hear a little bit of my voice. Um, but generally, I feel okay. It's just like a very mild cold at the moment. So, um, but it did mean I couldn't get out and about, couldn't get up to Stafford, which was a real disappointment. Um, and of course, what that has meant is I've now had to order all of the stuff that I was going to get at Stafford um, online. Um, and I do hope that most of that will come this week so we can have a good look at it um, when we're looking at the um, five breeding uh, setup that we will look at during this episode. And actually the um, setup of the five breeding cages and what I'm planning to do out there um, is going, still going to be the main focus uh, of this particular uh, video. We'll go nip out there in a minute um, um, and I'll run through uh, all the stuff that's changed, what my plans are, what's going on in there, um, what I'm currently feeding, um, that sort of stuff and why I'm doing it, I suppose. Um, just bear in mind that, you know, the finches, or sorry, the fives, not you know first time i've bred them this year i'm nowhere near you know and anywhere near consider myself to have any real knowledge about how to breed them so most of what i'm doing is just what i um, have learnt from other people uh, either through conversation and through watching various um, youtube channels online also in this episode we're going to have a slightly new feature which is the uh, i'm going to call it um, shed talk question time and this has come about because of there's been a number of questions that have been posed either on the YouTube channel or on Facebook um, that I thought would benefit everybody I've answered them on there but I thought I'd just talk about them uh, generally here um, I would say that this is just the way I do it so um, you know listen to what I'm saying if you want to follow it by all means but if you've got other ways of doing it then continue doing it um, your way um, if when I answer the questions of course you have a, a different you or you do something slightly different or a different approach um, then you know drop it in the comments or post it on the, the um, Facebook page we can all learn all learn something new can't we so that's a slightly new feature for this episode and of course we will take a look at the uh, budgery cars they won't be neglected in here what I'm going to do is whiz around the um, at the budgery car shed and just talk about some of the key developments that have gone on in here um, birds that have been moved, birds that are weaning, new eggs, um, new chicks, that sort of stuff. Um, it won't be a full breeding update, it will just be a, a whiz round and a quick look at the, um, uh, like I say, uh, the main changes that have gone on within the uh, budgerigar shed. As always though, if you enjoy the videos, don't forget to hit the like button. Uh, please do continue to comment. If you've got any questions, drop them in the comments uh, section and we'll carry those forward to a, a future um, episode um, I do try to answer all of the comments uh, as well I normally do that on a, uh, a Sunday morning so do bear with me if there's a bit of a gap between you um, dropping a comment and me getting back to you um, but that's just the way I normally have it planned I've normally got a bit more time on a Sunday morning of course don't forget if you aren't a subscriber to the channel then please do subscribe to the channel it does help the channel to grow and promotes the hobby more generally Okay, time to get me hat on and wedge out into the cold and take a look at those uh, fives. Well, as you can gather, we're out in the um, finch and five uh, shed. I'm going to take a quick look at the um, five setup so far, how I've got it um, set up so far. 
Um, the fives are still in the main flight at the moment, but we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. You can see I'm dressed up for the uh, Arctic conditions. It's actually snowing at the moment outside, so um, it is quite chilly. It's been down, I think, this week we're expecting it to get down to sort of minus two, minus three, I, I suppose. Um, so I don't know how that will impact on the birds. I don't think it will impact on them too much at all, particularly in here we have heating and I've said before that this shed is kept at about 10 degrees in here mainly for the foreign finches rather than for the um, canaries so uh, that's what it's like outside inside it's not quite so bad but it is still looking quite chilly out there so I'm dressed up for it so where are we with the um, bringing the fives into condition I'm doing this um, uh, I am taking my time over this I must admit it and I, I keep watching people saying, you know, on, on YouTube and in various other places and they're talking around, you know, some of them have got um, chicks already, um, lots of them have done lots of preparation and all the rest, rest of that stuff and are, are pairing up. And then there's still some people who, who haven't. Um, so I'm taking it quite slowly. My plan is I'm going to continue increasing the light in here over the next... Um, uh, probably about the next four weeks I think it is. Currently in here we're on um, uh, 12 and a half hours, no sorry, 12 hours of um, artificial light. So the lights are coming on at 6 in the morning and they're going off at 6 in the evening. Um, at the end of this week that will go up by another half an hour. I know that's slightly too much but that's the lighting routine that I'm following. Um, you may remember from a uh, a couple of episodes ago I spoke about the lighting routine that I'm following that I saw in Cage and Avery Birds. That's what I'm following so that's what it's looking like. Um, this means that certainly by the end of March we'll be up to around about 13, 13 and a half hours worth of light in here and then at the beginning of April we'll be up to 14. Um, so that's the lighting. It does mean that in about two weeks time you know we'll be up to um, the best part of 13 hours of light in the shed. Um, this gradual increase in lighting is starting to have an effect on the um, fives. You may remember when I um, had the night light on in here it brought the fife swell forward and we had cock feed and the hen, cock singing, hen walking, um, moving around continuously with bits of stuff in her, her beak looking like she wanted to um, go, go to nest. Since then, since I've turned it off, we've seen them come back again. So um, uh, the hen, well, she still carries bits around. There's no major um, indication that she wants to desperately go to nest. And the cockbird, for a little while, actually stopped singing. And I was a bit worried that um, he wasn't going to start singing again. But I have heard him. Um, in the last couple of days, he isn't in full song. There isn't a massive amount of song going on in here. Most of the noise remains to be the... Um, zebra finches uh, but he has been singing he has been singing again which is good news I suppose um, so um, that increase in lighting appears to be or the way I decrease the light and now gradually increase appears to have done the work so my feeding regime for the um, five septum hours remained unchanged so basically they're, they're getting a plain canary um, along with some foreign um, or a finch mix in there and that, obviously I need to put that in there for the finches um, so that's what they're currently getting and then alongside that uh, two days a week they get a, a, a bowl of soft food um, that I must admit they're taken to quite well it's my soft food that I use mainly for the, um, the buddhary guys so I will be looking at changing that very slightly um, so but that's what they're currently getting up to now um, my plan is over the next couple of weeks is to gradually um, change that a little bit and once I get them into the main cages or the main cage should I say the breeding cage so they'll be separate in two bits of the breeding cage um, once I get them into there my plan is to um, and sorry I better just say that's going to happen not this Friday coming um, but the following Friday I will be put on the following weekend I will be putting them into the um, breeding cage. Once they're in there I'll continue initially giving them 
Um, so uh, two days a week they'll get the um, soft food, but also two days a week I will give them a finger draw of tonic seed. And then additionally two days a week they will get, um, sorry, every other day, not two days a week, every other day the, they will get Avi Gold, um, uh, gold, you know, the supplements in the, uh, the drinker. So they'll get that every two days. Oh, sorry, every other day, um, and that's really just fits in with my regime around the rest of the shed. So that's what they will get in there, and then I will look to gradually increase the amount of um, soft food and the amount of tonic food that they're getting over the next, um, following that for the next two to three weeks until um, it looks like we've got them in condition and they're ready for breeding. So that's the, what I'm planning to do with the feeding. You, um, if there are any um, canary breeders out there, five canary breeders out there, let me know if I've got that drastically wrong. It's what I've sort of been seeing other people gradually doing in terms of increasing the amount of um, soft food and the amount of tonic seed. So that's the feeding. So let's have a quick look at what we got in this um, box behind me, which is the stuff I've got from. Um, uh, I, I ordered off of Hafe, so really it's not nothing very much um, in order to help me out. So I did get, um, I did have a look at the, these type of um, nest pans. Um, unfortunately, they're no good for the cage, so I need to have a rethink about the nest pans. The ones I've got from um, uh, Chris Green, the, the one I got from there that will do for now, is perfect for what I want and I'm going to have a look online shortly and see if I can find some of those felt, or at least another one of those going a bit cheap. Um, I did get some new felts so those are all done so there's 10 there. Um, I got some more finger drawers because um, I didn't have enough for the, what was out there with the budgery guards that I'm using and for in here and being able to swap them around. So I got some more finger drawers. And then we also got some canary eggs, so dummy canary eggs, which I'll just grab these and open them so you can have a quick look at them. So this is um, what they look like, just a little blue plastic um, dummy egg. Um, they look quite large to me, but who knows, um, I'm, sure they're, I'm sure that's right. Uh, and as I understand it, the idea is, is that as the hen lays, you will just take um, the egg out and replace it with um, one of uh, these eggs. So, and then when she's laid her fourth egg, you can then put the eggs back in, called setting apparently. So you reset the eggs back in there. And what that means is that the um, youngest, so you don't have a big disparity in between the age of chicks hatching. Hopefully most of them will hatch at the same time. So that's the um, dummy eggs. I've got five of those, so also oh, five. Let me just double check. Yeah, five of those. So I'm hoping that will will do just for my little pair here. So as I've only got a single pair, I can always get some more if I get another pair. See how it goes. So that's the um, the dummy canary eggs that I've got. Um, and that was just about it really. I've, like I say, I've got um, some uh, nesting material already, so I didn't need to go out and get any of that. Um, and I'm really quite looking forward to this new challenge, the challenge of breeding five canaries. And I know, you know, most of the canary types are probably not the most difficult of the canaries to breed, um, but I am looking forward to it um, and seeing how they go and what we get. Um, uh, from them and, and you know the, I'm sure there'll be trials and tribulations as there always is with breeding any sort of bird you know any sort of livestock brings with it its own challenges so there we are that's really at the moment all there is to talk about down here in the outside shed my hands are still starting to get a bit chilly down here and as I'm still feeding a little bit under the weather what I'll do now is finish out here and we'll pop back inside and we'll take a look at um, what's going on in the budgerigar shed.
Well, as we um, said earlier, there were a number of questions that had come in via the various uh, channels, so either YouTube or, um, oh, sorry, the YouTube channel or via the Facebook page. Um, and I thought what I'd do now is just quickly talk through um, the basically the answers that I gave to those various um, questions. Um, the first one uh, was around which of the or setting up the breeding cage, so you know introducing the birds to the breeding cage, and it's quite a common question that you will hear, um, and that is, do you put the cockbird in first, the hen in, both in together? What do you do about the nest box? Do you have that one straight away? Um, and what I would say is that you know almost all breeders find a system that works for them. So I'm going to talk about what I tend to do the vast majority of the time. There will always be exceptions to the rule and there will be people that will disagree completely with the way I do it and will say that it doesn't make any difference or we'll do it this way because this is the best way of um, introducing the birds. So, as I say, the way I do it, um, not all necessarily the correct way, but it's the way I find that it works for me. So, once I've identified um, the uh, breeding pair that I want to put down, um, I will have, 90% of the time, the nest box will already be on the cage, um, ready to go, but it will be closed off. What I mean by that is that the hen cannot have access to the nest box. The hole is shut. Um, I do this by reversing the uh, box in box style uh, nest boxes. Um, uh, I will then tend to put both birds into the cage together. If, if for any reason I can't do that, I will all, nearly always tend to then put the hen in first. So it's either both birds together or the hen in first. I seldom will I put the cock bird in first. I think that the hen needs more time to settle um, and she will then find the nest box and it, the nest box will, you know, look at, when she looks at it, I personally think that this can tend to stimulate her into uh, better breeding conditions. Um, and I would then introduce the cockbird, but most of the time I will introduce them both together. This gives them a, a chance to find, the, you know, to sort themselves out. Uh, you don't have one, the, the hen, who suddenly thinks that the nest box is hers and starts attacking the hen, that sort of stuff. So that's why I tend to put them in both in together. Um, nest box is closed, normally for two to three days. Um, you'll find that the hen will start to pay interest in it, that's what I find. Start trying to access it, she'll gnaw at the outside of it, all that sort of stuff. Um, and after about two to three days, I will turn the nest box around. One of the reasons I keep the nest box shows closed for those couple of days, along with trying to bring the hen in better condition, is it enables the hen and the cock bird to get to know each other a little better. And also, if the hen is in condition it will, and she wants to go straight into the nest box, if it's open, um, as we found out with one of the pairs earlier, the hen might go straight into the nest and won't have a chance for the cock bird to have made it with her. So that's the reason why I do it that way round. Um, the nest box, I tend to fill, but inside my nest box I tend to put um, uh, wood chippings. I don't use concaves, uh, so never never have done. So always use wood chippings in the bottom of the um, uh, nest box. Never had a problem with not having a concave, but then again I know some people who swear by concaves. So, uh, wood chippings, I fill them quite high and allow the nest box to be the hen to get in there and start clearing some of them out. A couple of reasons for this again, it prevents the hen from just sitting in there. Um, she'll tend to clear it and then come out again and go in and clear a bit more and then come out again. Um, the other thing it does, it allows me to clearly identify that the hen has been into the nest box. You know, I can see the uh, wood chippings, they tend to be over the bottom of the um, breeding cage. And also when you look in the nest box, you can see where she started to hollow out. Um, some hens will do more than others. I've had hens that have completely cleared the nest box and have to keep putting more wood chippings in before they go back down to, to lay. I have others that hardly touch it at all. Um, and if, in both those cases, I, I do tend to take a little bit of remedial action. So like I say, if they've tipped it all out, then what I will do is put a bit more back in there until she starts laying. If she hasn't taken anything out, I will, when she, the moment she starts laying, I will almost 
you know, I take most of it out and leave probably about half an inch at the bottom, uh, enough to stop the eggs from rolling about on, and um, then put the nest box back in and the eggs back in. The reason I do that latter one is I have had occasions where if the nest, the hen hasn't cleared the nest box sufficiently, she pushes the hen, the, the egg, into the bedding, and once she can't see it, she won't sit on it. And I've come in and found that the eggs have been cold. Uh, in most, like I can say, in most cases, you can move it out, put the eggs back in, and she'll sit on them, and um, and they'll warm back up again. And you know, touch wood, they'll they'll be if they're fertile, they'll still continue to hatch. So that's how I um, uh, put or introduce a pair to each other and into the breeding cage. So the next out one is a really tricky one, I think, and that is around uh, uh, feather plucking. Um, and I've had problems with uh, feather plucking. Those of you that have been with the channel for some time will know that um, I had a particular hen who feather plucked, I think it was a total of two rounds, if not three uh, rounds of chicks and I struggled to stop her from doing that. When that was going on, I did ask a number of people about um, what they did to um, try and prevent uh, feather plucking. So I'll just talk through um, what they do. The first one, of course, they will all, people will always say, don't use a hen that feather plucks and don't use the chicks off of the hen that has feather plucked. Um, <coughs> I understand where people are coming from with that. Me personally, if you only keep a few birds, you know, and you 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 have a, a hen that has feather plucked, and you've got youngsters off of that, that if they were not feather plucked, would be good birds, um, and you are limited to what you've got to use. You may end up having to use that. So, what I've found, and this is just my own experience, is that a bird that feather plucks can come off of a bird that has never feather plucked. So the ones that I had. There was no history that I could see in that family of feather plucking. So, uh, the other thing I found is when I have used a bird that's been feather plucked, um, it's not always the case that they will feather pluck. In fact, the birds that I've used that have been feather plucked have never fl feather plucked their young. So, um, so I've not had a particular problem with that. <coughs> if, however, you get a consistent run where you've got mother feather plucking, hen, you know, the child uh, offspring doing the same, then I would suggest that you stop doing it. Um, so where do we go with this position where we've got birds that are in the nest box and being feather plucked? Um, one of the things you can do, of course, is you could try and move the chicks so into another nest box if you've got chicks of um, a similar age. Um, one of the problems with that is quite often it's the, elder bird, the older birds that are getting feather plucked, um, so you don't realise it's happening until it's a bit too late. And sometimes when... Uh, uh, birds have started to feather up, they won't be taken quite so easily or into a foster nest box. Um, you could foster the younger ones, so the ones that haven't yet started as they hatch, um, and I in fact have done that. But if you haven't got anywhere to foster them, what do you do then? So, one of the things is, is you can put a piece of millet spray into the nest box. Um, I do this anyway, lots of people do this once the chicks have um, started to feather up. Um, I do it after the first chick has been run. Um, but you can, so you can try and do that. Sometimes it will just encourage the hen to peck at the, um, the millet spray rather than at the chick. Um, didn't work for me, but I know some people find that it does work. The other thing that you can do is, I've heard some people will put um, <coughs> sorry, Savaline, Savalon cream. <coughs> or Vaseline over the chick, completely smother them. Hen doesn't like the taste of it and therefore stops um, feather pluck or stops plucking and playing around with that particular um, chick. Like I say, I know in some cases that um, some people will say that that works all the time. Um, again, for me, and the one I did, didn't work completely. So I still had chicks. <coughs> Pardon me. Still, still suffering a little bit from the um, COVID uh, infection. So, like I say, for me, it didn't always completely work. So, uh, um, but those are two things uh, that I have heard around feather plucking. If any of you out there have found a cure for feather plucking on hens, then do let me know. 
um, and I will post it and I'll talk about it maybe in a future episode. Um, so post a comment, or post something over on the Facebook page and help us all out with the strange thing where a hen suddenly decides to start plucking, plucking the hen. Oh, sorry, the chick. And the final one for this episode is around cod liver oil in the um, uh, soft food. I was asked whether I ever put cod liver oil in the soft food. Um, the answer to that is I used to. I used to use cod liver oil in the soft food all the time. The reason I stopped using it was I found, and again this is just personally, I found that the when I put the cod liver oil in the soft food, the cod liver oil tended to go sour more quickly than any other of the ingredients in the um, in the soft food um, and I ended up chuck, having to chuck it away so I stopped putting it in there and uh, I found that the soft food now lasts the whole period of time I never have to chuck any of it away so it doesn't go off as doesn't go sour as quickly when I'm talking about this I'm not talking about it going sour uh, when you put it actually in the cage because it's not in there long enough to it but actually I tend to make a bulk of soft food and I keep it in the fridge. It lasts me for about two weeks in there. Never have any problem with any of it going off um, in those two weeks other than when I had put cod liver oil in it. And I would then find that after, just after about a week in the fridge, you could start to smell that sour smell that you get. And it was undoubtedly the cod liver oil that I found was, was causing that to happen. So that's the only reason why I don't use cod liver oil in my soft food recipe. Okay, it's time for a very quick update of the budgery bar shed and we're just going to run through some of the uh, main changes, main events that have happened um, here in the budgery bar shed. Um, the first of those is that the two uh, youngsters that were in um, cage uh, nine I think it was so the uh, cinnamon grey uh, opaline cockbird cross to the uh, dark green um, hen both of the two youngsters are there are now weaned and they are across over in the nappy flight um, and enjoying that and they all look and they look fine they've settled in into their um, reasonably well um, there's one of them that actually doesn't look too bad so I'm hoping that one will develop on through and it will give me something to work with next year. So that's um, those two birds that have weaned from uh, that cage. Uh, the birds that were in the cobalt cage, so the other part of the blue family, I suppose, uh, is the cobalt cockbird. Um, all of the four chicks that were in the nest box the last time we looked at them have now jumped the box and they're sat in the bottom of the cage. Noisy buggers they are. Um, only have to go near them and one starts calling and the other one starts shouting at me so um, yeah it can be a bit annoying just when I'm trying to change the food but there you go at least they're all out all on the bottom of the cage all being fed time now to think about what I'm going to do in terms of removing the cockbird or the hen from there um, I don't want them to go for, for a third round they've, laid, they've already had too many so that's the other big change over there so the other thing then is three chicks that are in cage um, one that's all virtually directly behind me. Um, uh, those three chicks develop well, all run, all looking quite nice. Um, definitely a, um, a, a pied in amongst them, as there was previously when I think we just had one after that. Um, so we've got three in there now. Uh, the oldest one looks like it should be leaving the nest relatively soon. So that's the birds in cage at one. And the really good news is, and we'll have, have a look at this now, the really good news is, is that the um, outcross, um, the cave outcross, with one egg that was full, that has hatched, being fed, looks all right, and I am about to ring that um, today, actually. So we will be ringing that, uh, and that's a step forward. We do have eggs in one other box. We've got to run through that at the next um, major update. And the other two new pairs that we've just put down, or the latest pairs that we've put down, both of those are currently sat in the box, but no eggs as of yet. Well, that is just about all we've got time for in this episode. In the next episode, we'll do a full roundup of the budgery guard breeding um, cages and um, and see what we've got in terms of each of the families. So we'll put the youngsters as well, the youngsters that are behind me. 
we'll pop those into the show cages as we normally do and have another look at those see how they have developed further and we'll take our first look at the two um, from uh, off of the opaline the grey opaline um, cinnamon cockbird uh, that are in the flight behind me so um, that's what we'll do in the next episode until then as always if you enjoy the episode please do um, hit the like button but of course most importantly do stay safe and enjoy your birds <laughs>